verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. I'll read that again. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. Let me remind you who wrote Ecclesiastes. It was King Solomon at the very end of his life, and his life was a tremendous rise and then a terrible fall. Solomon was the greatest king in the history of the world. He was the richest, he was the most influential, and for a short period of time, he was the most godly king who has ever lived. Monarchs and nobles visited from every nation to come to Jerusalem to sit under the wisdom of Solomon for days on end and to marvel at his kingdom because they couldn't believe the way that God had blessed him. And they would leave giving glory to that same God who made Solomon what he was. The foundation of his early wisdom and his success was his devotion to the Lord. And it all reached its climax when Solomon spent seven years building the temple of the Lord. In fact, his reign can be divided into two parts. The first part where he served the Lord with all of his heart, soul, strength, and mind, and the second part in which he served himself. When he finished the house of God after seven years, the glory of the Lord descended into the temple and was so great and so profound that the priests couldn't even minister. They couldn't enter into the temple. And that, in my opinion, was the greatest moment in Israel's history when the Lord descended to be amongst his people under the reign of Solomon. But Solomon's life took a turn for the worst. He turned away from honoring the Lord, and he fixated from then on on honoring himself. He took twice as long to build his own house as he did to build the temple of the Lord, 14 years as compared to seven. And Solomon, in the last half of his life, violated every directive given by God to the kings of Israel. Here are the directives. I'm going to read them for you from Deuteronomy 17, verse 16 and onward. The king must not build up large stables of horses for himself or send his people to Egypt to buy horses, for the Lord has told you, you must never return to Egypt. The king must not take many wives for himself because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. And he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. When he sits on the throne as king, he must copy for himself this body of instruction on a scroll, the law of God, in the presence of the Levitical priests. He must always keep that copy of the law with him and read it daily as long as he lives. That way, he will learn to fear the Lord his God by obeying all the terms and these instructions and decrees. This regular reading of the law will prevent him from becoming proud and acting as if he is above his fellow citizens. It will prevent him from turning away from these commands in the smallest way and will ensure that he and his descendants will reign for many generations in Israel. Solomon broke every one of these directives, every one of them, and as a result his life fell apart to the point where the kingdom of God was stripped away from him and split in half and he spent his senior years in deep regret. But one good thing came out of it. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And in it, he encourages us not to repeat the mistakes that he made. And what were those mistakes? Please listen carefully. He thought that the kingdom of God was for here and now. That's a mistake that all of us make. He believed that seeking wealth and personal prosperity was an end in itself and forgot to glorify God with his life. He didn't give attention to cultivating a relationship with the Lord and consequently failed to understand his overall purpose as king of Israel. And finally, he was weak in the word of God. Solomon had great wisdom and he wrote the book of Proverbs, the Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes. But nowhere is it recorded that he ever picked up the laws of the Lord 
worked and meditated on them day and night like his father David did. Solomon relied on his own human wisdom. And in the end, his wisdom failed him. But in spite of that fact, Solomon, even though he failed in many areas, he himself was saved by the skin of his teeth. And at least his life was salvaged and he didn't plunge into hell. In the end, all that mattered to the Lord was that Solomon's heart was right, that his mind was renewed, and that he died a true worshiper. That's all that God cared about with regard to the person Solomon. And that's God's overriding intention for each of you. He wants your heart to be right before him. He wants your mind to be renewed. And he wants to make sure that you die a true worshiper. In the New Covenant, his agenda for your life is more distinct and specific. Besides what we've already mentioned, God wants you to be like himself. He wants you to be like Jesus and reflect Jesus' mind and heart and action in every area of your life and to do the things that Jesus did. That's God's intent for every individual in this church, every member of the body of Christ. You, you remember last week we discussed the outward characteristics of the kingdom of God. We discussed the inward ones too. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's on the inside. But on the outside, we said there were three characteristics that make up a kingdom person. And there go the Italians blowing off some steam. I don't mind, it's good. <laughs> Love, worship, and service. Those are the three outward characteristics of someone who lives in the kingdom of God under the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Love, worship, and service. And with that in mind, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, writes in Romans chapter 8, regarding you and I, beginning at verse 29, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he called. Whom he called, these he justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. That's God's purpose for your life. Aside from the fact of what you may do for the Lord, when you stand before him at the judgment seat, what you do won't necessarily be the substance by which he judges you. He will judge you by the substance of what we read here. Because God's purpose in your life is to justify you, to sanctify you, and to glorify himself through you. And everything that happens to you from the time you commit your life to Jesus is fashioned and designed to take you through that process. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. That's true of every believer. Justification to forgive you of your sins, past, present, and future. The blood of Jesus accomplishes that. When you invite him into your life, the blood is applied to your life, and the penalty of sin is taken away forever. Then he moves you from justification to sanctification. He wants to destroy the power of sin in your life. We all have a sin nature, and God's intent after the day you are saved is to destroy and put to death that sin nature so that the inner man, the Spirit of God in you, may live. And the blood of Jesus also is efficacious towards making that happen. The blood of Jesus takes away the power of sin and the presence of the Holy Spirit in you allows you to live all out for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's sanctification. Then glorification is this, that everything you do from then on, once you've been justified and once you've been sanctified, you now have the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ, and everything you do now glorifies Him. He takes each and every one of us through that process. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. Now, not everything is easy when you go through that process. Not everything is going to be pleasant. Not everything is going to work out smoothly. Sometimes, through the process, it will seem that troubles never go away, that disasters will never stop happening, 
setbacks will continually occur and internal conflicts with raging emotions will never end. It feels that way sometimes, doesn't it? There will be times when you will be in a season that seems like it will last forever. But if Jesus is really the Lord of your life and you've submitted everything to Him, be assured that whatever you're going through now is all part of the process to conform you into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything. This is the kingdom process. And even if you mess up along the way, even if you drift away, even if you fall on your face and blow everything to pieces, if your heart continues to reach out to Jesus and you keep getting back up on your feet and keep running back to Him, God will have His way with you. Just keep coming back to Jesus, no matter what happens, no matter how difficult, no matter how badly you've messed up. Keep coming back to Jesus. Keep receiving His grace and eventually things will work out exactly the way that God intends them to. And don't worry, you don't have to rely on your own will to persevere. The Holy Spirit who lives in you will give you the desire to get up and to keep on moving and seeking Jesus and never quit. The Holy Spirit in you accomplishes this. So it's so important to know that you'll make it through the process. And that's why just before verses 28 to 30, the scriptures tell you in verses 26 to 28, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. For we don't know how we should pray, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. If you're going to make it through the process, you have to have some comprehension of how God works in a life, especially when things are not going the way that you expect them to. That's when you need understanding more than any other time. I'm talking about those times when it seems that God has made you a target for suffering. I'm talking about those times when He seems to be uninvolved or disinterested in your situation. Those times when it seems like He doesn't care and is doing nothing to change the circumstances of your life. I'm talking about those times when the promises of God don't appear to be working for you. And the teachings about His kingdom affecting every area of your natural life are not your daily experience. And so you wonder if the whole thing isn't an illusion. So this is what I want to focus on in this portion of today's message. And I want you to listen very carefully. If it's true that there is no separation between the supernatural kingdom of God and my everyday affairs, if it's true that God can overrule anything that I have to confront from day to day, if it's true that I can bring Jesus into every aspect of my earthly life or more, accu more accurately bring every aspect of my earthly life to Jesus, if it's true that as a citizen of the kingdom of God, I am not governed by the laws of the world, but I am governed by a higher order. If all of that is true, why is it at times that God does not fully intervene in my life? And when He does, He intervenes to a certain point, but then stops short. It seems like He doesn't do a complete intervention, a complete work. I want to encourage you this morning that this is God's pattern. And that pattern can be seen all the way through Scripture. You know, He could have given Jacob the inheritance and the blessing without Jacob having to deceive his father and then run afraid that his brother would murder him. He could have stopped Joseph's brothers from selling him as a slave he could have kept Joseph out of prison and made him ruler of Egypt without putting poor Joseph through all that trouble. Why didn't he? He could have deposed Saul and set up David as king without having David run from Saul for 14 years. 
He could have never allowed his people to be slaves in Egypt for 450 years. Yet, in spite of the fact that he did nothing for 450 years to deliver his people, in less than six months, he performs signs and wonders that bring the Egyptians to their knees, that cause Pharaoh to despair, and his people are released in one day. One day. Paradoxical. He works miracles left and right. He intervenes totally and absolutely, and at times he will intervene totally and absolutely for you. But he doesn't always intervene totally and absolutely. But let me encourage you in the times that he did. He rescued Daniel from the lions. He'll rescue you from the lions. He preserves Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. He'll preserve you in your fiery trial. He rescued Peter out of prison. He fed the widow of Zarephath miraculously through Elijah. And he will do the same for you. But sometimes the Lord doesn't make any sense. Sometimes he boggles my mind. And I fail to understand what it is that he's trying to accomplish because I know that he can work these kinds of miracles. I know that the kingdom of God and my earthly life have no separation that I can bring the king and the kingdom into my everyday affairs and see marvelous blessings from day to day. I know that. So why is it that he heals one person but then compels another person to go see their doctor? Why is it that he pays one person's bills miraculously but he compels the other to go to work and sometimes leaves the unemployed without work for a long period of time. Why does he prevent an accident for one, but doesn't prevent an accident for the other, but they come out alive, even though they should have died? And why is it that in some accidents, the Lord allows some people to die? How do you explain this inconsistency? Why are some people given blessings on a silver platter? while others have to work hard to acquire their blessings and others are not blessed at all in their area of concern but made instead to endure. Why? Why is one delivered instantly and with the other deliverance is delayed and the oppression goes on for months and months and months? Confounded. I am confounded this morning because I don't have the wisdom to answer those questions. Why is it that sometimes after you've done all that you can that you know is right, there's still no change, no results, no fruit? These are difficult questions, especially in the light of the teaching that says there is no separation between the kingdom of God and your everyday life. So what is the answer? The reason I wrote this message is because I know that many of you are exactly in that situation. On the one hand, you've been blessed, and God's intervention has made a way. On the other hand, His intervention hasn't yet come. And you've done everything you know how. And you don't understand why He has not rescued you out of the situation yet. I myself... I'm in a situation like that. But I feel for you. And that's why in the last 10 days, I diligently sought God for an answer, for some kind of comfort, especially in the light of Daniel Mahedrin's cousin being struck down by an irresponsible driver and killed at the age of 23. Where was God? Why didn't he prevent it? I don't know how you're going to receive these answers, but they are answers. And they come straight from the Word of God. And I can tell you before I get into the answers, that when God doesn't make any sense, when he's done something that I feel is unjust, when he hasn't answered me the way that I expected him to, when I did everything his word told me to do, and still there was nothing. 
when I tried for hours and hours and days and weeks and years to figure it all out and come no closer than I did when I started. Please hear me when I say bitterness is not the answer. Anger towards God is not the answer. Frustration and disappointment and de depression is not the answer. And hopelessness and despair is not the answer. There is only one answer, and Job gives it. Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When I am confused about what God is doing, the only response I can think of that is appropriate that will build me up and edify me is to worship and praise him with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind, and say to him, though you slay me, yet I will praise you. I will trust in you. Because he knows better than I. So the first answer is this. God is sovereign, and only he knows his reasons. But those who trust him know that he's always just, he's always right, and he always does what's best for all of us. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 say, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. A few years ago, I went to a show and I saw an artist, a painter, splatter paint all over a giant canvas. It looked like a total mess. He literally picked up buckets of paint and whipped it into the canvas. He took brushes and flicked the paint into the canvas and it was just an ungodly mess. It was a disaster. And then when he was finished throwing paint and tossing buckets onto the canvas, he took his bare hands and started smearing the paint all over the place and making lines with his fingers. And I thought to myself, what, what kind of nonsense is this? And then he turned it over. He was painting upside down. And when he turned it over, we all saw that it was an exquisite portrait of Martin Luther King. It was absolutely unbelievable. And we applauded and gave him a standing ovation, though moments before we were confused and thought, this guy's crazy. That artist reminds me of God. Your life may look like a mess right now, and God is just throwing things at you left and, life, uh, left and right, and it seems like it's a total disaster, but soon he's going to turn it around. And when he does, you'll see that he knew what he was doing all along, and he has painted your life into a masterpiece. A masterpiece. While he's painting and splattering and making no sense, and tossing things at you left and right, remember this. All of it, every part of it, is the kingdom process to make you like Jesus. And when God is finished, you will be like Jesus. Isn't that all that matters? Solomon said, and we read it before, he makes all things beautiful in his time. <laughs> Even Solomon, who fell away so miserably, 1,000 wives. He was, if he was with a different woman every night, it would take him three and a half years to get through them all. Multiplying horses, multiplying gold, building temples for false gods to please his wives. The kingdom stripped away from him. A total disaster. Should have been rejected. Committed more sin than Saul did. Even Solomon was made beautiful in his time because the misery that he experienced led him to repentance. So now it's all a matter of trust, isn't it? This is what the Lord wants to develop in you, to bring you to that place of repentance. I'm not talking about repentance from sin, no. I'm talking about the repentance that causes you to change your mind and to allow your mind to be renewed until you come to that place where the only thing you trust in your life is this right here. I'm holding it in my hand. This is the repentance that God is looking for. That you, like Solomon, would conclude 
before the end of your life, there is only one duty that's worthwhile for every man and woman. To know the word of the Lord and to obey it. To trust in the Lord with all your heart and to lean not on your own understanding. To in all your ways acknowledge Him and trust that He will direct your paths. Since you don't know what you are doing, and He does, I admonish you and encourage you to be still. Don't try to figure it all out. You never will. Trust in Jesus and He will work it out. He will work it out. He makes all things beautiful in His time. There's a time for that healing. There's a time for that deliverance. There's a time for that supply. There's a time for that empowerment. There's a time for that intervention. And if the time is not now, blessed be the name of the Lord. When the time is right, He will show up. It's all part of the kingdom process. Now here's another part of the kingdom process that will help you to understand the ways of God and how He works in the life of an individual. Solomon says that God has put eternity into the hearts of every man and woman. We read that right at the beginning of the message. Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has put eternity in their hearts. No one knows what God is doing from beginning to end, but he has put eternity in our hearts. I thought about this for a long time, and the Lord gave me an amazing revelation. Something I've never thought about in all my Christian life. Eternity is not just living forever. That's not what God has placed in your heart. The desire to live forever. Even pagans have. But He's placed eternity in your heart. That is a desire for what eternity represents and what that kingdom is all about. So your desire for eternity is not just a desire to live forever. But to be in a place of no tears, to live in a place of no sorrow, no sickness, no pain, no conflict, no fear, no decay, no breakdown, no heartache, no death. Your desire for eternity, hear me, is a desire for God's perfection. And that's what He's put in your heart. And why has He done that? Listen and follow me very carefully. He's done that for this reason. In our spirits, there's a desire for the perfection of God, for the perfect justice of God, for perfect unconditional love, for perfect security, all the things that you would expect to find in the kingdom of God which shall last for all eternity. That's what he's put into your heart. And when things break down in this life, we get deeply hurt. We get brutally offended. We get bitterly disappointed. We get desperately fearful and angry and confounded and inconsolable. That means so upset we can't be comforted. Why do we get so upset when this world burns us? I'll tell you why. Because we know in our hearts that that's not the way it should be. God has put eternity in your heart. God has put a desire in your heart for godly perfection and when the world lies to you when the world betrays you when the world falls short of that protection or that uh, perfection the soul and the spirit protests because the desire for eternity that God has put in my heart is a desire for his perfection and the world will never give me perfection will never give me perfection and I get indignant when the world burns me because I know that's not the way it should be. So he allows the hurts, the setbacks, God allows the disappointments, God allows the betrayals, the fear, the confusion, the injustices to remind you never to place your hope in this life, in this world. That's the reason. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground, worldly ground, human ground, secular ground, unbelieving ground, is sinking sand. That's why God allows the hurts, 
so that you will never stake your claim in this life but always look to eternity which is coming he does it so that you don't store your treasure here so that you don't invest yourself wholly in this life or love the world or especially trust the world God is saying to you trust me don't trust the world the most important thing that he does when setback comes is to shout at you this is not the place of perfection that you are looking for I'm talking about this life even in the Lord even filled with the Spirit of God even as a member of the church even as a citizen of the kingdom of God this side of eternity will never be the place of perfection that your heart is longing for. So don't long for it. It'll never happen here. Never. The world may promise you perfection, but the world lies. And the Lord will never allow you to think that the perfection that you're looking for is in this life. Never. But it can be found. It can be found right now because there is a place of perfection that's available to you right now. There's a place of peace and security and comfort and power and confidence and love and joy and peace available to you right now. Even in this imperfect, lying, deceiving, conniving, corrupt world, there is a place of perfection. There is an opportunity for you to go into the place that your heart longs for. You know what it's called? The presence of God. That's the only place that is perfect on this side of eternity. The presence of God. And guess what? Your troubles cannot follow you into the presence of God. Trust me on that. When you are in the presence of Jesus and when you are soaked and when you are saturated in the Holy Spirit, you don't remember the sorrow. You don't remember the pain. You can't hold on to the fear. You can't hold on to the confusion because in His perfect presence, all those things that are not part of the kingdom of God melt away. They melt away. And even if you enter in with those things, and it happens every time. It's happened every time in my life. When I enter in with fear, with anger, with depression, with disappointment, with heartache, with a sense of betrayal, with a sense of insecurity, when I enter into the perfect place of the presence of God, He doesn't rebuke me. He doesn't condemn me. He embraces me. And when He embraces me, all those things melt away. And I leave the presence of God liberated. If you go into the presence of God and you leave with the things that you came in with, you haven't been in His presence long enough. You need to linger. And you need to tarry. And that's what God is trying to teach you. Don't put your trust, don't look for your security in the things of this life, not even ministry. But look for your security in the presence of God. Because that's where you'll find it. That's the only place you'll find it on this side of eternity. It's so important because it's not his will for you to be overwhelmed by the things of this life. So no matter what happens to you or the people around you, Jesus always provides comfort for your pain. He may not remove the pain. He may leave the pain for a little while to teach you to stay close to him where there is no pain. There is no pain in his presence. and to develop Christ-like character. And I hope somebody will post this on Facebook. I know I say this almost every week, but this is true. I want you to hear this very carefully. If you've heard nothing else, it is impossible to develop Christ-like character without adversity. It is impossible to develop Christ-like character without adversity. So you can be sure God will allow adversity in your life to chisel you until you become like Jesus.
And he wants you to know that if you experience pain, it's not going to last forever. And in the kingdom of God, every, every pain has a purpose. If you're going through something and it's causing you pain, it's for a purpose. The kingdom process is underway. God is unfolding his kingdom process to make you like Jesus. Third point. Sometimes the Lord could intervene, but he doesn't for a higher purpose. If Joseph had not gone to prison, as unjust as it was, he never would have interpreted Pharaoh's butler's dream, and he never would have had the opportunity to do the same for Pharaoh himself and become second in command in all of, G all of Egypt. So, so the Lord kept him in prison. You may be in a prison right now, and you don't realize that the prison is the pathway to your breakthrough. So why is it that you're asking God to deliver you from what He is using to bring you to a breakthrough? But you've got to understand the mind of God. If you attribute your pain to the devil, or you attribute your pain to the flesh, and sometimes pain can come from the flesh and from the devil, and you've missed the point that this particular trial is pain from God to conform you to the image of His Son, you're going to miss out. That's why it's so important to read the Word of God, to understand how He works in the life of believers, and understand fully and completely and clearly what He's doing in your life. Very, very important. I think of a couple of situations last month. I think of Charlie, Linda and Leon's dog. Somebody told me, go pray for the dog and ask for healing. I didn't feel led to do that. However, when Helen prayed for her dog, Buffy, Buffy was completely healed. So we know two things. We know sometimes God doesn't heal and he heals dogs on occasion. So why didn't he heal Charlie? He didn't heal Charlie and intervene in that way because he had a higher purpose. You want to know what that purpose was? To appeal to the brothers and sisters of Leon and Linda to come to their aid and to give out of their pockets and to, and to get the body of Christ to unite to do something wonderful for a brother and sister. It had nothing to do with the dog. It had to do with God's purpose. So some of you reached into your pockets and you pulled out 20 and 40 and 50. Some of you even gave $100. And Leon and Linda were spared a huge expense and Charlie is just fine. And now I find out that Charlie has recovered from his injury in two weeks. The doctor said he should be out for six months and already he's running around after two weeks. So we see a full intervention of God in one sense and no intervention of God on the other sense because he had a higher purpose to gather the body of Christ together to come to the aid of Leon and Linda. I think about Lorelei. Lorelei fell out of the window two weeks ago. Two Sundays ago she fell 20 feet. If she had landed on the cement, we would be, we would be mourning a funeral in Bethel Pentecostal Church, the funeral of a child. Instead, Lorelei landed five feet uh, away from the window, did not fall on the cement, fell on all fours on the dirt, and her head hit the cement and swelled up until her eye was closed. And within a week, that swelling went down. She had no broken bones, no eye damage, no nothing. It was an outright miracle. But why didn't... Yeah, go ahead, give the Lord a clap off her. And I said to myself, well, God could have stopped Lorelei from falling by simply pushing her back into the room. And if he had done that, no barrier would be put up, and maybe Michael would be the next baby to fall out the window. God always has a higher purpose. Here's one that's going to be a little bit painful for you. But please understand, I can think of countless times that the Lord ended relationships between guys and girls to save them from heartache and disastrous marriages and to keep them and preserve them until the right person came along. Do you know how many times Wendy and I have seen that? Hundreds. Where two people got together and thought they were right for each other and the Lord broke them up and thank God he did because shortly after that the right person came into the picture and they were, they've been happily married ever since. We've had a couple of those here. Because the Lord sometimes will not intervene and will not bless something because he has a higher purpose. That's why it's so important to trust in him. 
That's why it's so important not to try to figure everything out. And especially so important not to put your hand on it like Abraham and Sarah did with their maid Hagar and try to help God along. He doesn't need your help. He needs your trust. He doesn't need your help. He needs your trust. In fact, better for you to take your hands off and let God do it. The main reason why intervention is withheld is the process. You have to understand that over and above all of your earthly desires and your earthly needs, God has a greater agenda for you. Never forget that God has a higher agenda for your life than simply blessing you here and now. Much higher agenda, and it's this. To be conformed, and I've said it five times now, to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be justified, to be sanctified, and then to glorify Himself through you. That is God's agenda. And He will do everything that He can to make that happen. He will do whatever is necessary to bring that about. Because there are two things that are more important to God than you and your earthly desires. Number one, you yourself, you are infinitely valuable to Him and His purpose for your life. Those are the two most important things that God thinks about when He deals and intervenes in your life. You and your purpose. Everything else is secondary. Last but not least, let's remember that we still all have a sin nature. We all have a sin nature. And if God made it easy all the time, if God miraculously intervened in every situation, if He always gave us exactly what we wanted, when we wanted it, and made our lives as smooth as silk, would it make us better people? No, it wouldn't. It would feed the flesh. Imagine if God gave you everything that you wanted. It would feed your flesh. It would make you a spoiled brat, weak, pathetic, cowardly, because the flesh is that part of you that wants everything to be smooth and easy and trouble-free. You cannot develop Christ-like character apart from adversity. And the flesh wants no part of adversity, no part whatsoever. The flesh is revolted by the cross. And the cross is the only doorway to the mind and heart of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. And adversity sometimes is tied into compelling you to carry your cross. If He gave you everything that you wanted, your heart would be far away removed from the heart and mind of Jesus, and your relationship with God would be ruined. I know a girl personally who thinks her father is a great hero. You want to know why she thinks her father is a great hero? Because he never says no to her. Father never says no to his daughter. She gets everything that she wants. He bails her out of every situation when she gets into trouble. She pays her bills. He rescues her. And she gets whatever she wants. You name it. All the while telling her how wonderful she is. So yes, she considers her dad a hero when actually he is her worst enemy. Her dad is her worst enemy. Why? Because he has not prepared his little girl for real life. He hasn't prepared her for setbacks. He hasn't prepared her for heartache. He hasn't prepared her for disaster. He hasn't prepared her for fatigue. He hasn't prepared her for times of want. He hasn't prepared her for dry seasons. He has given her an easy path. And guess where she's going to go when things get tough? She's going to go running to dad, only he won't be able to help her all the time. Only God can help her. The worst thing he's done is that he's replaced the role of the Father in heaven in her life. It's God who makes things easy that are smooth, or that are rough. It's God who makes a way. It's God who cuts a path in the wilderness. And this guy wants to be God to his daughter. No wonder he's a hero. And that's why God works sometimes the way that he does. Because he knows if he gives us everything that we want, we won't be prepared for the adversity that he uses to conform us to the image of his son. So trust Him through the tough times and know that for every valley there will be a mountaintop. 
and learn to appreciate both the valleys and the mountains. They're both the work of God. His kingdom process is underway in your life, and he who began a good work in you shall complete it until the day of the coming of Christ Jesus. Now it was at this point that I got stuck because I asked the Lord for an illustration to close this message off with a bang. You know, that's what they teach you in seminary. You preach a good message, tell a great story, or give an illustration that will really drive the point home. I couldn't think of anything. Not a thing. And then finally the Lord gave me this verse. Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 and 17. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. On that day I will make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a, son, as a man spares his own son who serves him. And I thought, there it is, there's the key, jewels. We are God's jewels. And when I studied how jewels are made and where jewels come from, I saw the kingdom process of God in the making of those jewels, and it looked just like the same process he's using in the lives of every one of you. First of all, I found out that many jewels start off as basic common material, such as clay, sand, and soot. And as they absorbed the rays of the sun over time, they transform. The clay becomes sapphire. The sand turns into brilliant opal. And the soot or black charcoal turns into diamonds. Just like you, the kingdom process, illustrated in geology. You are his jewels. You may be made of common material, but as you soak in the heat of the sun, the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be transformed into precious treasures. And the kingdom process that we've been talking about all morning accomplishes that. I read specifically about the master jeweler who refines diamonds. And that really connected me with the process of God. I've been walking with the Lord for 40 years. And I've watched the way he works in my life. And the master diamond cutter is exactly how God works, has worked in my life. The master diamond cutter recognizes diamonds while they're still black, while they are still pieces of charcoal hardened by the heat made strong. See, you may not see your gifts and you may not see your talents and you may feel that you amount to nothing, but God sees past your weaknesses and past your inconsistencies and he sees a diamond in the rough. He sees something that he can work with. So you may put yourself down, but to him you are valuable and you are precious because only the eyes of Jesus can look into your life and see the value and the glory that is locked up in you by his spirit. You may not be able to see it, but he sees it. So the master diamond cutter sees the diamond while it's still black as charcoal. Think about that. While you are still black as charcoal, God sees his glittering glory in you. And so he separates the stone from the bedrock, just like Jesus separated you from the world. He saw something in you that was salvageable, something that he wanted to save, and he separated you from darkness. He separated you from condemnation. He separated you from judgment. He separated you from deception. He separated you from unbelief and transferred you into the kingdom of his light. That's what God did. Just like the master diamond cutter separates that black charcoal, which he knows is a diamond, from the bedrock. Then he cuts off the excess and shapes it and cuts the stone into a beautiful form. It's still black, but he cuts it and shapes it into the form that it will be before it goes into its setting. And there's only one way to cut a diamond. Use another diamond. He uses a diamond to cut this stone and shape it the way he wants it to be shaped. And I thought to myself, unbelievable. I have the Spirit of God living in me. That's the diamond in the rough. But I've got excesses and I've got 
things of the flesh and I've got dirt and filth and garbage that is in the way of God to perfect me into the image of His Son. There is only one thing that can cut the diamond in me through the Spirit of God and conform it into the image of God, and that is the presence of God Himself. He is perfect, He is pure, He is holy, and His holiness makes me holy. Come on, give Him a mighty clap off for it. Gutman cuts diamond, and the Spirit of the Father unleashes the Spirit of God in me and cuts away all the garbage. Then He polishes it. The master diamond cutter polishes the diamond. I was amazed at how they polish it. They take a file. And they start to rub. The diamond's cut now. They start to rub the smooth parts. They start rubbing and rubbing and rubbing and rubbing. The diamond is so hard it stands up to the file. But while the file is moving across the surface, the diamond becomes polished. And the diamond cutter knows it's perfect because as he's filing, he's listening for a particular sound. And when he hears that sound, he knows that the polishing process is finished. I thought to myself, wow, just like the Lord. Just like the Lord. He draws his file of affliction and adversity over our lives. And the sound that he hears as he allows challenges to come into our lives determined how much more work he has to do on us. He listens for a sound. If he hears the sound of complaining, he keeps working. If he hears the sound of discontent, he keeps working. If he hears the sound of fear, he keeps working. If he hears the sound of confusion, he keeps working. The sound he is looking for is the sound of praise. He keeps working. The sound of worship. He keeps working. The sound of trust. He keeps working. The sound of unconditional love and adoration. He keeps working. And when he hears worship and praise and trust and adoration and complete submission, he knows the polishing process is over. And guess what? You are now like the Lord Jesus Christ. Give him another clap offering. When he hears perfect worship and submission, he knows the polishing phase is over and the jewel has been perfected. And that's what he's doing in you. That's what he's doing in you. Would you stand? If the situation is not over, it's because the process is not over. When the process is over, the situation will end. Now that's true for somebody here, so please receive that as a word from the Lord. When the process is over, the situation will end. Here's another word. As long as you keep whining and complaining and speaking words of fear, he'll keep filing. Because he hasn't yet heard the sound that he's waiting for. The sound of trust and submission and worship and praise. If that's for you, just receive that into your heart. Let it work in your heart. And the last thing I'm going to share with you is, I think, probably the most important. I said that without adversity, 
you cannot develop the character of Christ. Why? Because the flesh gets in the way, you see, and the adversity kills the flesh. As you trust the Lord, the flesh is destroyed because of adversity, because the flesh hates adversity. So that fear, the confusion, the reaction to adversity that comes from the flesh is put down, and adversity actually helps you to be a spirit-filled man or woman because you, you resist the flesh and you face the circumstances in the spirit and you become like Jesus when that happens. And tied in with that, I would tie in with that and we'll close with this. If you're weak in the word of God, if you're weak in the word of God, you will never be like Jesus. Because the word of God is his primary instrument in helping you understand where you are, what God is doing, and where you're going. And you'll find that out on Tuesday as we examine the life of Jacob. You're going to see this Tuesday coming and next Tuesday how God works and how God chisels and refines and polishes and puts through his people through that kingdom process until they become the way he wants them to be. And you will see yourself in the life of Jacob and in the life of Joseph and come to that understanding of what, of what God is doing in your life. And once you come to an understanding of what God is doing in your life, you'll be able to praise Him and you'll be able to, to say, you look, do whatever is necessary. Let the process last as long as it needs to last. I submit to you. I will praise you all the way throughout. I will not give in to fear, depression, anger, frustration. I will continue to put down my flesh because I know at the end I will be like you and I want to be like you. And that's what God is doing. How many people understand that now? Would you raise your hand? Okay, good. Would you bow your heads? Father, we don't always understand what you are doing. Sometimes you make no sense. But you understand what you are doing. Like that painter who splotches the canvas left and right indiscriminately so it seems you are putting together a masterpiece I know that's an old cliche in the church that God is painting a masterpiece and that the dark shadows of the uh, the dark shadows that he puts are to accentuate the good parts I, I don't believe that I believe the dark shadows are just as essential towards the masterpiece as the bright colors and I don't believe that the dark shadows are there to make the bright colors stand out I believe the dark shadows are there because they need to be there I just pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give patience and that you would give a complete heart of trust to the people of this church. I pray, Lord, that they better understand now what you are doing in their lives and that they would cooperate with you by submitting to you and worshiping you and praise you and waiting for the final result. Because this, this too shall pass. And soon the pain will accomplish its purpose and we will be like jewels in your kingdom. So, Father, I submit this entire church to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. We have fellowship downstairs. God bless you. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you downstairs for lunch.